Welcome, ladies, to the Joy of Living Bible Study, the letter to the Philippians. And I hope you are as excited as I am to be back in Bible study together. Have you heard the saying that if you aren't moving forward, then you're falling behind? You know, our spiritual lives have been compared to walking upstream. Walking with Jesus means going and walking against the depraved culture, going against the current that's always pushing us backward. This letter exhorts believers to keep moving forward, even when we face adversity. Philippians is a letter that was written to a mature church from a mature Christian, Paul, an apostle of the Lord Jesus Christ. <clears throat> the church in Philippi wasn't perfect, since no church is, but Paul's desire is for this mature church to continue to move forward, to grow spiritually. The theme of the book of Philippians, which we talked about last week in the introduction, is that joyful, victorious living is costly but Jesus is worth it. Today in chapter one, we're gonna have the opportunity to watch and learn from a mature Christian. You know, some years back when my grandchildren were still living uh, close by, I was having lunch with friends and we were um, discussing our plans for the week and I just nonchalantly said, well, I have to keep the grandkids this week. And my, a wise friend of mine stopped me and she said, no, you get to keep your grandchildren this week. Her wisdom uh, has really stayed with me through the years. And that is exactly what Paul's passion was, was living for the Lord. He didn't have the mindset, oh, I have to live for Jesus. Instead, his mindset was joyful. I get to live for Jesus. What a privilege it is that we get to live for Jesus. So today, if you haven't already, get your Bibles open to Philippians 1. And as you do, we'll open with a word of prayer. Lord Jesus, I confess that many times I see the glass half empty rather than half full. But Lord Jesus, I pray today as we study your book, um, your word that is living and active, that it will give me and others, all of us, this yearning and this re really a passion, Lord, to live for you. And that nothing in our lives would be things that we would love more than you. Help us to walk in, in love, and to love you more and more because you are worth it. In Jesus' name, amen. Well, on your handouts this morning, I've divided Philippians 1 into two parts. The first one in verses 1 through 11, we're going to look at the marks of a Christian, where this is looking at Paul and the Philippian church. And the second part is that mature Christians rejoice despite adversity in verses 12 through 30. So uh, verse 1 says, Paul and Timothy, servants of Christ Jesus. Well, number one on your paper is that mature believers serve rather than to be served. The ancient letters began with who was writing the letter, which was very different than how we write our letters today, that you get all the way down at the very end of the letter to find out who it's from. But this letter we're told here that is from Paul <clears throat> and Timothy, who called themselves servants of Christ Jesus. That Greek word here is doulos, which actually means not even a servant, but a slave. One who surrendered to do his master's commands. And we see a real humble attitude from Paul here that we don't have to serve Jesus. We get to serve Jesus. The second part of that verse, it says, to all God's holy people in Christ Jesus at Philippi, together with the overseers and the deacons. 
Who are we talking about? Number two is to understand who we are affects where we live. In verse one, it says, uh, God's holy people, who we are, we are saints. Now, my version says God's holy people, and your version, it may say, means saints, but it's the same thing. That we are citizens, they may be um, the church at this point, uh, it says that they're citizens of Philippi, but they were actually living in Greece and they were living as citizens of Rome. So here uh, we are God's holy people. We are his saints. And Paul is saying that even though that they're living in Philippi as Roman uh, citizens, that our citizenship is really in heaven. We are aliens walking on this earth and a people really <clears throat> who don't belong here. I know when my son moved to Utah because of his job, um, people would love to say, wow, you're not from around here when they heard him talk because of his Southern accent. Well, you know, the way people see us, the way we walk and the way we talk, people should say the same thing about us. You aren't from around here. You're different from the world. Number three on your paper, let's look at verse two. It says, grace and peace to you from God our Father and the Lord Jesus Christ. Number three is to take advantage of God's grace and experience peace. Our earthly atmosphere, in order for us to breathe, we need nitrogen and oxygen. And our spiritual atmosphere, we need grace and peace. <clears throat> of course, that acronym of grace <clears throat> is God's riches at Christ's expense. But I came across another great um, definition for grace is that all of God's wisdom and power is available to us. We have unlimited riches in Christ Jesus. And I know Ephesians 1 is a great place to go and read about all those wonderful resources and riches that we have in Christ. So one prayer that I begin my day with each, each day is that, Lord, give me your grace because I have a wandering heart and I am definitely in need of your help and strength to fight the battles that come my way today. So grace and peace are what we have. What about peace? Well, peace is actually a result of experiencing God's grace. Those mercies that are new to us each morning I always say that God gives us so many do-overs. We never flunk. Um, he leaves us when we experience his grace and those mercies, then he leaves us with a deep sense of contentment and peace that the world cannot have. Isaiah 26, three says, you keep him in perfect peace whose mind is stayed on you because he trusts in you. In verses three through five, Paul begins a thanksgiving here, and he says, I thank my God every time I remember you. In all my prayers for all of you, I always pray with joy because of your partnership in the gospel from the first day into now. So in verses three through five, um, number four on your paper is that mature believers live in Christian fellowship. Paul is remembering the Philippians here with thankfulness and fondness of the great memories <clears throat> that he has with them. That church that began in Lydia's living room on his second missionary journey. The Philippians had been faithful to support his ministry of spreading the gospel and they did it with their money with their financial gifts, and they also did it with their prayers. Bill Lawrence, a seminary professor, said, happiness is based on happenings, but joy 
comes from relationships. And you know, there are many Christians that don't see the need of being in fellowship with like-minded believers. And I know COVID has increased that, that so many people uh, don't wanna come back to church. But you know, throughout the New Testament, there's no such thing as a solitary Christian. And I think one of the best places for us to see that, from to see evidence of that, is at the funeral home. Um, there are many people that die alone and are buried alone. But in Christians, when you go to the funeral home, you see a whole different atmosphere. It's an atmosphere of celebration and remembrance of a person's life. Christians experience death, but we do it with hope and expectation. In verse 6, it says, Being confident of this, that he who began a good work in you will carry it on to completion until the day of Christ Jesus. Number five is that mature believers have the assurance that God completes what he starts. I know we had a question this week in our lesson about, are you ever discouraged when you look at your personal Christian progress? And you know, it's very, it's difficult for us to really see change in our life just from day to day. Um, but you know, there are four stages of our Christian life. The first one is we were once without Christ. Number two is that the time of salvation, we became in Christ. And that third one is where most of us, all of us hopefully are, are that we grow up in Christ. And then that last one, number four, is that we are with Christ. So from first to last, it's all a part of God's good work in us and through us by the Holy Spirit, which he has given as a down payment of our inheritance. Looking on now in verses seven and eight, it's right for me to feel this way about all of you. And I love this because these next couple of verses, I think were written with a Southern accent because he said, it's right for you, for me to feel this way about y'all, all right? Since I have you in my heart, and whether I'm in chains or defending and confirming the gospel, y'all share in God's grace with me. God can testify how I long for y'all with the affection of Christ Jesus. Paul said, I have you in my heart. Does it sound like a Valentine's card or maybe what's stamped on that heart candy? But you know, Paul's love is different from the world's. It's not just a fickle feeling, but love is an action word and in its evidence of true salvation. Jesus says in John 13, I give you a new commandment. Love each other just as I have loved you, you should love one another. You know, the Philippians had that kind of love for Paul. They didn't turn their backs on Paul when he was thrown into prison. Instead, they supported him as he suffered for the gospel. And of course, we have that wonderful chapter in 1 Corinthians 13 that just reminds us what love is and what it isn't. But love always protects, it always trusts, it always hopes, and it always perseveres. And that's the kind of love um, that we can't work up on our, on our own. It's something that God does in and through us, through the work of the Holy Spirit. In verses 9 through 11, and it says, And this is my prayer, that your love may abound more and more in knowledge and depth of insight, so that you may be able to discern what's best, and may be pure and blameless for the day of Christ, filled with the fruit of righteousness that comes through Jesus Christ to the glory and praise of God. You know, uh, number seven on your paper is to pray for those um, 
uh, mature believers pray for those they love to grow in Christ. What are you concerned about? You know, I find myself during the day being concerned about so many things that are trivial, like, you know, what to fix for dinner tonight. But here we see Paul's prayer for the Philippians, uh, that he is burdened not just for their physical needs, but for their spiritual lives, that they should grow in Christ. And Paul prayed that the church's love would increase. And remember, they... Philippians already were, was, they were a loving church, but love can always get better, all right? It would increase. And for them to put that love into action, because when they did, it would be the greatest witness to a, the lonely world. You know, when we see a need, God's showing that for us so that we can meet that need. And James tells us that faith without works is dead. So he wanted them to to grow in love, but he also wanted them to grow in knowledge and and discernment. Or in the NIV says depth of insight. All right, we need to love others with knowledge. So when we go to meet that need, we need to learn the situation of that need. And, you know, and apply some common sense. That's something that the world is lacking today. There is a time to help and there is a time not to. And I think the story in the New Testament that Jesus tells about the prodigal son is a great example. The father didn't offer to help the son when he was determined to sow his wild oats. Instead, he let him go because at that moment he could do nothing else. But when the son returned in humility, the father's help was available. Discernment is really recognizing God's best, even from not just bad, but recognizing the best from what is good and what matters most. He wanted the Philippians also to grow in holiness. It says to be pure and blameless, and pure means sincere. Victorious Christian living is without hypocrisy. You know, uh, many times we will tell our children as they're growing up, never lie to me. Uh, You can come to me for help. And that's exactly what God the Father asks us to do, to come before him honestly, and to learn to hide nothing from him. That is what uh, hypocrisy is the opposite. Next, we see that um, in knowledge, discernment, love, holiness, he says to produce the fruits of righteousness in Christ Jesus for the Father's glory. You know, a natural result of seeking God honestly and sincerely is the fruit of the Spirit. And we know those are uh, mentioned in Galatians 5. But that fruit is not produced by our will and our effort, but instead it is a result of God working through us to produce Christ-like attitudes and behaviors. Jesus says in John 15, when we abide in him, when we abide in Christ, we bear fruit. We can't bear fruit unless we remain in Christ. Now let's look at the second half of this letter, which is mature Christians experience adversity in verses 12 through 30. And Paul now is going to share um, his personal experience as he is in prison. And in verses 12 through 14, he says, Now I want you to know, brothers and sisters, that what has happened to me has actually served to advance the gospel. As a result, it has become clear throughout the whole palace guard and to everyone else that I'm in chains for Christ. And because of my chains, most of the brothers and sisters have become confident in the Lord and dare all the more to proclaim the gospel 
without fear. So on your paper, a mature Christian, number one, is a mature Christian recognizes that obstacles are really gospel opportunities. And I came up with that one from a quotation from Ray Steadman, who is uh, who was a godly theologian. And he said, a mature Christian recognizes that in God, ob- obstacles are really opportunities. Nothing can imperil the gospel. You know, Paul encountered Jesus on the road to Damascus, and he was called by Christ to be his chosen instrument to spread the gospel. And we can find that account in Acts 9. Paul's dream was to take the gospel to the ends of the earth. But as he wrote this letter to the Philippians, he was under house arrest and he was chained to to a Roman soldier. You know, he could have been utterly devastated, discouraged because a dream that looked like it had died. Some of you today may be experiencing the death of dreams, maybe because of a death of a child or spouse or physical limitations that you're experiencing or financial setbacks or broken relationships um, that you had hoped would work. But I think right here in these verses, we can take courage from Paul because he saw God's grace at work and the gospel advancing even though he was in prison. Paul realized that he had a captive audience four times a day. That means guards, there were four different guards that were chained to him every six hours. And he had an audience there. They could not get away. And they heard the gospel day in and day out from Paul. And sure enough, some responded to the gospel and the gospel spread, it says, according to these verses, that it had spread throughout Caesar's house, uh, throughout his household. And not only that, that God, that God was using Paul's imprisonment to actually produce confidence rather than fear in other believers to share the gospel. Well, in verses 15 through 18, and number three on your paper, is that a mature Christian can rejoice in another's success. This is a biggie. You know, there were certain Christians who were jealous of Paul's success. And instead of preaching the gospel the correct way, they preached the gospel. They were preaching the right gospel with the wrong motives in order to exalt themselves. But Paul, regardless of the mixed motives, whether they were preaching for wrong motives or they were preaching for the right motives, it didn't matter to him because the gospel was powerful and people were being saved from it. In verses 19 and 20, uh, the next one on your paper is that a mature Christian rejoices in prayer and the Holy Spirit's resources. Look at verses 19 and 20, and notice that the word rejoice here. Uh, For I know that through your prayers and God's provision of the Spirit of Jesus Christ, what has happened to me will turn out for my deliverance. I eagerly expect and hope that I will in no way be ashamed, but will have sufficient courage so that now as always, Christ will be exalted in my body to uh, to, will be exalted in my body, whether by life or by death. You notice how confident and optimistic he is. He doesn't say, well, I hope that I can live for Christ. I hope I can exalt Christ in my body. I hope it will turn out for the best. 
No, he knows for certain. He's optimistic. He is confident because of two things, the prayers of the saints and the resources of the Holy Spirit. You know, there's nothing that gives us more confidence in knowing that we can depend on the prayers uh, of other believers. You know, uh, when we when we aren't dependent on the fellowship of believers, we're missing that abundant life that Jesus prayed for us to experience. You know, I am thankful that I grew up with a mother who prayed for me daily. But today I can count on two people who faithfully pray for me each day, my husband and my godly mother-in-law. You know, do you have people in your life that count on you to pray for them each and every day? And I hope today in our small groups that we're learning the joy, uh, that abundant living, that we have the privilege to pray for one another each week. Not only was Paul wasn't dependent also upon his own resources and his own efforts in midst of his adversity, but he knew he had the unlimited resources of the Holy Spirit. And you know, those two things gave him great confidence that in, enabled him to glorify Christ, whether it meant being released from prison or being sentenced to death. In verses 21 through 26, I want to read these because these are really the guts of chapter 1. And in verse 21, which is the key verse of the whole book of Philippians, it says, For to me to live is Christ and to die is gain. That may have been the verse you chose to memorize this week. If I'm going on living in the body, this will mean fruitful labor for me. Yet what shall I choose? I don't know. I'm torn between the two because I desire to depart and be with Christ, which is better by far. But it's more necessary for you that I remain in the body. Convinced of this, I know that I will remain and I will continue with all of you for your progress and joy in the faith, so that through my being with you again, your boasting in Christ Jesus will abound on account of me. A mature Christian, number four, can rejoice in life or death. As I mentioned, that key verse for me to live is Christ to die is gain. It really reveals Paul's view of life. Christ was the object of his devotion, the person that drove his existence. In his situation, he had no idea which way it would go as he waited for a trial before Nero, but he knew it would be for God's glory regardless. He could trust God's perfect plan. You know, as Romans 8, 28 tells us. But, you know, many of us trust God's will as long as it's going our way. Well, but what about when he's refining us into the image of his son through the fire of hardships and suffering? Paul's goal in life basically was to bring glory to Christ regardless of his personal outcome. And, you know, Paul could rejoice that remaining alive would be for the benefit of the believers. But to die, of course, would be with Jesus would be far better. But he was thinking again of his followers, his followers of Christ, those that he birthed as he started that church, that he could remain alive to disciple them and guide them to grow in Christ. Lastly, number five, as we look at verses 27 through 30, is that a mature Christian walks a life worthy of the gospel of Christ. So in verse 27, Paul says, whatever happens, whether it's life or death, conduct yourselves in a manner worthy of the gospel of Christ. Then whether I come and see you or only hear about you in my absence, 
I'll know that you stand firm in one spirit, striving together as one for the faith of the gospel, without being frightened uh, in any way by those who oppose you. So Paul gives his only command here in this chapter, encouraging the believers in Philippi that they too will one day face persecution and opposition, but to behave like the citizens as citizens of their true home, which is heaven. And he tells them, you can stand firm. You can stand firm when you face opposition because you're not standing alone. You're standing together with other believers, united in one spirit and one faith. John 17, Jesus prays his prayer for his disciples before he goes to the cross. And what does he pray for? He prays for unity of the believers, of of not just the disciples, but future believers. That unity would cause the world to take notice because believers who are divisive are do just the opposite. But those who are united cheer one another on because they're on the same team. In verse 29 and 30, he says, For it has been granted to you on behalf of Christ, not only to believe in him, but to also suffer for him. Since you're going through the same struggle you saw I had, and now hear that I still had. He says, it has been granted to you on behalf. In other words, it's a privilege to suffer for Jesus. I hope that last day uh, that you discussed in your small groups today of all those wonderful verses that we looked up that really gave us a different mindset that we don't have to suffer for Jesus, but that we get to suffer for Jesus, that it is a privilege to do so. Jesus suffered to rescue us from death and ourselves. And the verse that I love this week was 2 Timothy 3.12 that says, Everyone who wants to live a godly life in Christ Jesus will suffer persecution. And it is a privilege to do so. Ladies, how would you fill out Paul's statement, his life verse in verse 21? For me to live is blank. What would you honestly fill in that blank. What do you think is really living to you? Well, the aim today at the bottom is may we face all adversity with joy because we are in Christ and we get to live for his glory. And I want to end with a hymn Believe it or not, I'm not very familiar with this hymn, and I couldn't sing it if I wanted to, but the words are wonderful. And it comes, it's based on the Psalms 93.1, the Lord, the Lord reigns. And it's called, Lord, reign in me. Over all the earth, you reign on high. Every mountain stream, every sunset sky. But my one request Lord, my only aim is that you reign in me again. Over every thought, over every word, may my life reflect the beauty of my Lord, because you mean more to me than any earthly thing. So won't you come and reign in me again? Lord, reign in me, reign in your power over all my dreams. In my darkest hour, you are the Lord of all I am. So won't you reign in me again? Ladies, I pray that will be your prayer this week as you walk with the Lord, that for you to live is Christ. Have a great week.